Well, hey, I want to welcome everybody who is joining us uh, here in person and uh, say a huge welcome to our growing online community. Love having you here. And uh, hey, I want to begin by uh, showing you a picture that I think is going to change your life. Are you ready for it? You ready? It's going to change your life. I'm going to show you a picture of me at age 17, okay? Getting ready to go to prom. I'm going to throw that in there, all right? Here you go. Here's the picture. Now, there is a lot to unpack in, in this picture. You know, uh, first off, I'm not sure what the teddy bear is because that's not my teddy bear. I'm just going to confess to you right now. I'm not sure where that came in. Can't remember uh, who had the teddy bear. This is actually my friend Mike, and uh, he is holding uh, actually uh, the dog that I grew up with. Samantha is an obnoxious schnauzer, uh, but Samantha made an appearance in this picture. And uh, I just want you to look at this picture. First off, look at, just look at that hair. I mean, you cannot tell me that that is not great hair. Now, you, you might not know this, and you probably don't because you weren't with me at age 17, but uh, I actually had such long hair that I, I would put it up in a ponytail quite often. And uh, my, it drove my mom nuts, but, you know, I thought it was cool. And, uh, you know, as you kind of look at this picture, you're probably thinking, Mark, you were a real chick magnet at age 17. And I would have to agree, okay, at least in my, in my own opinion. Uh, but this is actually me at age 17 getting ready to go to prom. And as I pulled out this picture... Uh, I, I, I started to think about some things. I, I was thinking about life at 17, and I started to ask this question. How did I think my life was going to turn out when I was 17? And has it turned out the way that I thought it would? And so I began to think about some scenarios. And uh, one of the scenarios was, uh, I'm mean, at age 17. Uh, I, I never thought I was going to go to the University of Miami for college. I mean, that wasn't even on my, my list of places to go to college and when I was 17, I was going to major in pre-med, and then I was going to become a doctor. And so I started uh, in pre-med. First semester, I have to take Calculus 2. I get a 27% on my first Calc 2 test. The next day, I change my major to business, thankfully, as far as that's concerned. Uh, at age 17, I had a very serious girlfriend, and uh, we had been uh, together for over a year, and I thought uh, that this person could be, to, be the one, only to find out a few months later that she had more than one one in her life. And so uh, that relationship dissolved pretty quickly, and fortunately, uh, God had another one for me, uh, and, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, speaking of marriage, when I was 17, when, when people would talk about marriage, I, I, don't, you know, I don't know how you thought about marriage at 17, but I thought, marriage has got to be easy, you know, because it's just passion and chemistry and kind of all that stuff. You know, how difficult could it, could it be? Uh, when I got married to my wife, Donna, uh, our first year was the hardest year of our life. We almost didn't make it out of, out of the first year. That, that's how different I, I, marriage turned out for me, at least for the first year. And, uh, and then I would have bet you, when I was 17, a million dollars that I would not become a pastor. Because when I was 17, I couldn't stand church. I wanted nothing to do with church. But, as you can see, I would still be paying that debt back to this day. You know, as I, as I look back at my life, here's my conclusion. My life has been filled with one detour after another. Now, I want you to do something for me. I want you to think back to your life at age 17. And for some of you, you know, that's not a long time ago. For some of you, that might be a longer time ago. And as you think back to your life at 17, how did you think your life was going to go? And has it turned out the way you thought it would? And I think if we're honest with, with ourselves, you, you would probably have a, a very similar story to, to my story. It'd be like, we think that our life is going to go into this straight line, but it doesn't go in, in this straight line. Our life goes these twists and turns and ups and downs. I mean, our life is filled with a bunch of unexpected detours. Well, today we are kicking off a, a series I'm really excited about that is called Detours. And we all know what a detour is. A detour is an unexpected or a longer path. And because of that, we don't like detours very much. But over this course of the series, we're going to actually do a deep dive into this whole idea of, of when we encounter detours in our own lives. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about not only how do we deal with them, but also how do we thrive in the midst of these detours. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to do that by looking at the life of a guy named Joseph. Now, for many of us, we, we hear Joseph, and we think of Joseph in the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph. But if you're new to the Bible, I want you to think, this is how the Bible is broken down. The Bible's broken down into two major parts. There's the Old Testament, and then there's the New Testament. And the New Testament starts with the time of Jesus and beyond, and the Old Testament is before Jesus. Mary and Joseph are in the New, but the Joseph that we're going to look at, he is actually found in the very first book of the Old Testament. And if there's anybody that is an expert on a life of detours, 
It's our guy, Joseph. You know, some of you are in the middle of a detour right now. You know, maybe you're, you're single and this path of singleness you're on has gone way longer than you hoped it would and you just want this path of singleness to end. Or maybe you're dealing with infertility in your family right now and you just want to have a child. I mean, you just want, you want to have kids. But that's not in the cards for you. This is not what you expected. Some of you are just coming out of a divorce and you're wondering, well, what, what's next for me? For some, your detour is just an unexpected career change. And you found yourself picking up the city that you, you lived in and you thought that you would live in and you moved to southeast Wisconsin and now everything is new for you. Or maybe you're having financial trouble, legal trouble, or, or maybe for some of you, you know, you're just, you just feel spiritually lost right now in your life. You see, here's what's true of, of all of us. We're either going into a detour or we're in a detour or we're just coming out of a detour. No matter what, detours are a part of our life. And so I want to actually give you a new definition of what a detour is. And this definition actually came from a pastor, Ashley Woodridge, out of Christ Church of the Valley in Phoenix, tremendous church. Uh, they helped us a lot with this series, so give credit where credit is due. And uh, in this definition that Ashley gives, that we're going to look at, this is the definition that is going to drive our entire series. So here's what Ashley says about, about, de about detours. He says, a detour is a change in our plans. Now, I could just kind of stop there and go, whoa, that's enough right there. We don't want a change in our plans. Straight line, as far as that's concerned. A detour is a change in our plans. God uses. Okay, that's what we're going to start to talk about throughout this series. Okay, the plans change. What happens when they change? Okay, well, God's going to use. And he's going to use it to develop our character, which we're going to touch on a little bit today, and our competency, so we can arrive at a better destination. Mark, are you saying that this is going to take us somewhere else? It's going to take us somewhere else, and, and it's going to take us somewhere better if, if, and those are two that's a huge word right there, even though it's a small word. If we allow him to do that in our lives, and that's what we're going to talk about as we kind of roll through this series over the next couple of weeks. Now, today what I want to do is I want to introduce our, our guy, Joseph, and not just introduce him, but I want to introduce his first of many detours in his life. And so here's what the writer of Genesis says about Joseph. It says, Joseph a young man of 17. And so we're going to start with Joseph as, as he's 17. I'm sure he had a great mullet like I did. Was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's, not wife, but wives. And so we're going to see right from the beginning that Joseph comes from a very messy, dysfunctional family. So Joseph's dad's name is Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons from four different wives. And check this out. And two of the wives, they're sisters. I mean, this, you, you think about this, this kind of sounds like one of the stories of the backwoods of Kentucky, you know? And I can say that because I lived in Kentucky for five years, okay? I mean, this is exactly what this sounds like. But what we see is that Joseph's family is very messy and they're very dysfunctional. Unfortunately, most of us can relate to this. And, uh, and he brought, so this is Joseph, their father, a bad report about his brothers. And so as we're introduced to Joseph, we are introduced to him telling on his brothers that Joseph, in other words, is a tattletale. Now, anyone here grew up with siblings that liked to tell on them? Now, I, I'll be honest with you. I was the youngest of three, and so this was me, okay? I had to have a tool in the toolbox, so to speak, and so I would always tell on my brothers. I was thinking about this when I was writing this message. I, I, I don't know why I had this bad memory. I was flashing back to when I was really little. I was probably five or six years old. And uh, my brothers, who, like I said, they're older. They were babysitting me. And uh, we were wrestling around when a turd rolled out of my pants in the family room, okay? Now, they didn't see it, but I saw it, okay? And, uh, and so I, I didn't want anyone to see it. And so I kind of pretended it was not there. My parents got home. And they were, obviously, they were like, whose is this? Now, everybody knew it was mine, okay? But I didn't know that everybody knew it was mine. And so I, I said this, I, my older brother, Rick, I said, well, it's Rick's. And Rick is like 14, okay? And so I was like, it's Rick's. And then they were like, it's not Rick's. And then we had a dog named Micah, and I go, it's Micah's. It's not Micah's. And so, you know, I even told on the dog. That's how bad I was as a tattletale. But we're going to see that, that, that Joseph, we're gonna use, he's a tattletale, but he is more than just a tattletale. Now Israel, and Israel's another name for his dad, Jacob, loved Joseph 
more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And so Joseph's mom was Rachel, and Rachel was the wife that Jacob loved more than all the others. But Rachel uh, and, and, jo- and Jacob, they couldn't have kids until eventually they had kids in, in their older age. And so here's what you have. You have favorite wife, has son named Joseph. Guess what happens to Joseph because of that? Joseph then becomes the favorite son. And here's what we're going to see. And he made him an ornate robe for him. And so Jacob makes Joseph a very special robe. And his brothers, I mean, they could see that Joseph was was the favorite child of his dad. And one of the reasons they could see is because when they would go clothes shopping with their dad, they would go clothes shopping at Goodwill while Joseph got to go to Gucci to clothes shop. And that, that special robe that he had, that special robe actually represented that he would get more of the inheritance than all his other brothers, which is usually the older ones that got more. And so this was very, very uncommon. And so it's not, we don't have to guess to see how his brothers felt about Joseph. It says, then his brothers saw that their father loved them more than any of them. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. And now you would think that Joseph, he he would have the emotional intelligence to, to pick up on this and to be sensitive to his brothers about their situation. But here's what we're going to see. He actually is the opposite of that. Because as we're going to see, Joseph at this point in his life, he is entitled, he is prideful, he is boastful. Honestly, he is just an obnoxious little jerk at this point in his life. So much so, listen to what he says to his brothers. He said, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, what's the dream that he had? Joseph looks at his brothers and he says, hey, I have a dream that all of you were bowing down to worship me. Now, just a little free advice for all of you who have siblings in your life, okay? If you have a dream that they are worshiping you, listen, that's great, okay? But just here's the free advice. Just keep it to yourself, okay? I mean, and you would think, you're like, well, Mark, you don't have to give me that advice. I get that that's common sense. You know, it is to us, but it's not to Joseph because this is how entitled he is at this point in his life. In fact, later he has a second dream. And in this dream, his entire family is bowing down to him. And he tells his dad about it, you know, because his dad's bowing down to him in this dream. And his dad just starts to lay into him and says, Joseph, knock it off. Now it's from here that we see it's kind of, it, it springboards into what becomes Joseph's first detour. And so here, here's what happens. Joseph's brothers are out in the field working and uh, Jacob is, is wondering, like, I wonder if those guys are messing around again. I wonder if they're really doing their job. And so he decides to send his, his favorite, well-dressed, tattletale son out to check on his brothers. And here's what happens. It says, so Joseph went out after his brothers and found them near Dotham. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. And so while they're, they're going through all these different plans to get rid of Joseph, uh, Reuben, the oldest, steps in and says, hey, let's not do anything yet. Let's just throw him in a well for now. And so that's exactly what they do. And it says, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And so they go after daddy's robe right away, first thing. And they took him and they threw him into the cistern. And the cistern was empty and there was no water in it. And so there's just rocks at the bottom of this thing. And so they just throw him into a deep pit. And just like that, Joseph's life has changed. And I would bet that some of you, you can relate to that very thing. I mean, it's like your life is going great. And then in the next minute, your life has changed. And you were thrown into your own version of a deep pit. Well, that's what's going on with Joseph. And while he's in the bottom of this, of this well crying for his life, his brothers are at Chick-fil-A and they're kind of talking about what they're going to do with Joseph. And Judah, one of their brothers, speaks up. He tries to be the voice of reason for them. And he says, hey, listen, let's not kill him because then the guilt is on our hand. But let's sell him because at least we can make some money off of him. And you thought you had bad siblings in your life. Well, this is exactly what happens. Some Midianite traders come through and they sell their brother Joseph for 20 pieces of silver and then they take the robe 
that this dad made, and they rip it up, and then they show it to, to the dad and say, some animals killed your son. Meanwhile, they celebrate because now they don't have to deal any longer with their hated brother. And then, here's how the first part of Joseph's life ends. It says, meanwhile, the Midianites, who the brothers sold him to, sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Just think about this. At age 18, Joseph steps into his first detour alone and nearly 300 miles from home. But it's from Joseph's story that we learn some things about detour that are not only practical for his life, but are also very practical for our lives. And so I'm going to give you today three things that we learn about detours that are a part of all of our lives. Here's, here's the first thing about detours, is that there are basically three causes of all detours in our life. The first one is, is our bad choices. And every single one of us has many, many stories of bad decisions we've made, and as a result of those bad decisions, that put us on the detour that we needed to go on. Now, a, a second cause is others' bad choices. Once again, we, we all have a ton of, of stories of bad decisions other people made, and as a result, that had a ripple effect, and it put us on an unexpected detour in our life. But this third one, this third one is, is hard to not only understand, but it's really hard to accept. And that is some detours are caused by God's divine hand directing our lives. Now, as you think about Joseph's story that we just told and that you know, he's sold into slavery, which one of these would you say caused his detour? I think when we look at this, we quickly jump to this one. Right? And we're like, okay, well, it's, you know, it's his brothers, and you know, they beat him up, threw him in the well, and then they eventually sold him into in slavery. And you know what? They're, that's true to a degree. But if we're honest, we also have to look at this first one as well. That, that Joseph played a part in, in his own detour that he took because he kept you know, bragging and boasting, and uh, he kept poking the bears known as his brothers, saying, you worship me, you worship me, and as a result, they responded from that. But later, we're going to see that this one right here played a part in Joseph's story, that God was actually this entire time, that God was actually directing him to go to a place that he never would have gone on his own. In fact, let's, let's fast forward to the end of Joseph's story. And we get to the end of Joseph's story. Joseph is near the end of his life, and he's looking back on his life when he was, in, he was 17 years old. And he looks back at this situation in particular, and he's talking to his brothers because, as we're going to see, they reunite years and years later. And here's what he says to his brothers. He says, you intended to harm me. And so that first cause, he's calling it out. He says, hey, this is on you. You brothers played a part in this. But God, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so Joseph realizes as he's saying that, hey, now I see that God also had a part in this detour. And this is really challenging for us because when we're in the middle of a detour, we can't see God's hand directing things. We can't see it until we allow ourselves to get to the other side of the detour. And that's exactly what Joseph is doing here. Now, let me just kind of, kind of throw this out at you. Could it be, could it be, and what if we could actually get to a place where we view all of our detours through the filters of, hey, what, what people meant to harm me or get back at me or to hurt me in any ways, but what people meant to harm me that God can actually use for the good. You know, what if we could actually see our detours through that filter. I mean, think about this. Why is that so difficult to do? I think one of the reasons that is so difficult, I think this is the main reason, okay? I think one of the reasons is, is that when a detour intersects our life, we tend to start blaming. I mean, we blame other people, we blame ourselves, and we get really angry, you know, we even start to blame God. The amazing thing about Joseph's story is that with all the detours that come into his life, and we're going to look at some just incredible detours that come into his life, not 
once does Joseph ever blame anyone else for any of his detours. And I, I think this is a really important lesson for us to learn. Because what we see in our culture right now is we see a huge issue that's coming out that is causing more hurt than help for people. The issue that we're seeing right now is that we are encouraged to actually play the role and stay the role of the victim. Victimhood is actually celebrated in our culture nowadays. Now listen, if you become the victim and you stay the victim, and, and I understand that there is a, a, a small percentage of, of you that you're in situations where you have no control O, o, over that situation, okay? And I'm not talking to that small percentage. I'm talking to kind of the larger percentage. That if you become and stay the victim, you know, you, you, just need to, you just need to know this. You'll never move forward. And it'll not only hurt you, but it'll hurt those closest to you. And I know that some of you, you have, you have been hurt lately. And if that's been you, it's okay to hurt. And it's okay to wrestle. And it's okay to ask questions. But if you've been the victim Here's a question I want to ask you. How long are you going to stay the victim? Because the longer you stay the victim, the less likely it's going to be for you to move forward. And listen, God designed us to move forward. Listen, he designed us to be a victor, not the victim. And so if you're kind of living in that place right now, can I just encourage you to do something? Would you be willing to stop playing the victim so that you can begin to step forward and fully embrace the future that God has for you? So we see this, this first thing about detours is that, you know, there's, there's multiple causes of them. Here's the second thing we learn about detours is that God uses detours to develop us. Now, if you want God to do something great in your life, and I hope you do, I mean, I do. If you're arrogant and you're entitled and you're boastful and you're selfish, just like Joseph was, you just need to know that God can't and most likely God won't. Here's what we need to realize just about life and leadership and influence. And this is true for all of us, that you can have growth or comfort, but you rarely grow while you're comfortable. And this is what we see in Joseph's life. I mean, he is comfortable being daddy's favorite and he is comfortable wearing these cozy robes and wearing probably cool shoes and being the one that goes and, and tells on his brothers all the time. I mean, he's in a comfortable place. But as he's in this comfortable place, he cannot grow into the person that God wants him to be there. And so as a result, he gets moved out with the help of God. And when he gets moved out, we're going to see he begins to truly grow. Uh, when I first... Uh, stepped into to my ministry career, I was on the fast track. I was actually on staff at one of the fastest growing churches in the entire country, and uh, they had actually asked me to be the first campus pastor of, of this very large church, which was just a, a, a huge deal. Well, shortly after that conversation, uh, this church went through a complete shift in leadership, and uh, they, they did some things that, that, that weren't uh, fully above board, and uh, they ended up just cleaning out 37 staff, staff people. And they said they were only going to clean out seven. And I was one of the 37 that, that they cleaned out. And just like that, I went from fast track to this, this position as campus pastor of a very, very prominent church to then working construction waste site sites just to pay the bills. And I'm telling you, when that happened, uh, I, I felt angry and confused. I mean, I'd left the corporate world to do this. And I just remember thinking, okay, God, I, I left all of this for this. What are you doing? And I remember being afraid because I'm like, I, I don't have the connections anymore that I did. So I'm like, God, you know, what, what am I going to do now? I mean, I just felt really alone. And, and like I said, uncertain of the future. I didn't have a whole lot of skills to add at, at this point. And it was a really uncomfortable time for me. Because me and construction sites are like oil and water, you know? I mean, I don't build or construct anything, and it, it never stays, stays good if it did. I mean, here's the thing. I thought about this. I'm on these construction sites. I put people in danger there, okay? Just by having me there, I put people in danger. But I tell you this. I look back at that time of my life and that detour as one of the greatest growth seasons of my life. If I hadn't gone through that season, I wouldn't be here. And this is ultimately where, where, where God wanted me to be. Because there was so much Joseph in me, more than I, than I would like to admit. 
And God had to take me through a detour to get that stuff out of me. And see, here's the thing about development. And I just, like I said, we don't, we don't like this stuff. But here's the thing about development. Not only is it uncomfortable, but it never comes pain-free. And that's one of the reasons why God uses detours in our life. I mean, how many times have you been driving and things are going great and then you see a detour sign and you're like, yes, a detour. Man, I, I love this. I love detours. Now, you've never done that, right? I, um, we, I can remember uh, not too long ago, I'm driving to the gym and I see a detour sign the way I always go. And I, I just ignored the detour sign and I just kept trying to go. And then obviously the road's blocked and I'm, I'm like mad. I'm, and, and I'm thinking, I just ignored the sign. And uh, then I had to go back and drive all the way around. And then I did this. This detour sign was up for three months. And for the first two months, every day I ignored the sign thinking the detour sign wasn't going to be there. I mean, I was in detour denial. And the reason I was in detour denial is because, like all of us, I don't like detours. We, we try to avoid them. They're painful at times. But here's the thing. When God is ready to move us to the next level, things often get worse before they get better. And I know you don't like that, and I know I don't like that. But it's often how God works in our lives. You see, God wants to do something in our life so we can do something significant in our life, and he will use detours. And they're never comfortable, and they never come pain-free. Final thing, and I know that you're like, man, this is like, this is great, you know? Pain, this, this one's better, okay? I can promise you, this one's better. Third, the third and final thing, Detours will reroute us to a destination God wanted. But we never would have wanted. Now, this is where it gets fun. You see, as we look at Joseph, Joseph never would have gone to Egypt. Never. Yet, this is where God wanted him. Because as we're going to see later in, Je in Joseph's great story, Joseph ends up rising to be the number two person in Egypt. He's working directly with Pharaoh. And God uses him to save the entire nation's life, including his family. And this wouldn't have happened if God hadn't allowed this detour into his life. I want you to think about, about your life for a minute. I bet some of you, you met your best friend or maybe even your spouse because of something hard that happened in your life. Uh, I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people who started businesses because their prior job just fell apart. Uh, I, I, know, I know stories of people who ended up moving to southeast Wisconsin. They moved to this area, and they didn't want to be here, but then they discovered the ridge, and then God just began to transform their life, and it all happened because of this detour that they were on. And for some of you, that long season of singleness, God ended up using that, and he ended up changing you as a person. And because of that person you changed into, your spouse came in at just the right time. And here's the thing. You would have never had that spouse if you never would have gone through that season or that detour in your life. You know, I, I just think that when we think about detours, instead of looking at them as life sentences, which we often do, I, I just think we need to look at them as, as seasons. Seasons where God's going to take us through because he wants to develop us, and then he wants to take us to a place, a destination that we would have never gone without him. So here, here's what I'll leave you with as, as we just kind of kick off this journey. I'm going to leave you with two questions. And I call these wrestling questions. I mean, these aren't questions if you like, okay, I know the answer, I know the answer. No, this is not. These are questions you want to wrestle with, and I hope that you do. Because these questions are that important, especially as we begin to see our life from a much different perspective. Here, here's the first question. What is God teaching you from your current or past detours? What's he teaching you? And this is an important question because this is where we have to zoom out and we begin to think bigger picture in our life. How might God be using or have used some of these past detours to develop you? And what might he be developing you for? And then the second question is one of those questions where we begin to peel back the layers of the onion a little bit more and we get to the core of stuff. And, and here's the question. How would you think and act differently if you leveraged your detour for good. Not fought against it, not played the victim with it, not blamed other people for it, but how would it look if you actually leveraged your detour to allow God to make you into the person that he wants you to be? And if that's how you, that's how you saw it, what would you do differently? How would you respond 
differently. So, this is the introduction to Joseph. And I hope as we go through this journey, I hope that you'll read his story along with us. In fact, if you don't own a Bible, I want to encourage you to do one of two things. One, download the YouVersion app on, on, your, on your phone. If you don't have it, it's a, a phenomenal, phenomenal a Bible app. Or if you're here in person, we actually give Bibles away for free. And so when this service is over, I want to encourage you to detour when you get this to the next steps room and uh, just ask for a free Bible. They'll give it to you, no strings attached. And uh, so I want to encourage you to do that. But there's so much more with detours that we're going to dig into. But here's what I want you to see. Here's here's what I want you to see. God sees more for you. That he has a bigger vision for your life than you have for your life. But the way that he's going to get you there is not the way that we would get there. You see, we want a straight line and we want quick and comfortable. But do you know what quick and comfortable gives us? Small and shallow. And you don't want small and shallow. You see, God knows exactly what we need. It's why we need detours. It's why God wants us to experience detours. And he'll use them for sure to develop us. And they're going to be uncomfortable. And yes, they will cause pain, but it's okay. Because that pain comes with great gain. That God will use that pain if we allow him to. To reroute our lives to a better destination. And it's a destination that we wouldn't go on our own. But it's a destination when we do, we will be so glad we did. Let me pray for us. Father, um, this topic hits home to all of us in some, in some way. Because detours are, they're a part of our lives. Some are a huge part, some are becoming a huge part, or will become a huge part. And so, Father, just as we journey through this season, to really look and dig into what detours are, would you help us to just kind of zone out? And begin to see things through a different perspective, a different filter that you are actually and can be directing divinely these detours that we're experiencing in our lives. That you can take them and just use them in ways because you have different ways that you want to direct and guide our life. And so God, as we do that, just open up our hearts, open up our minds. May we see and hear and know exactly what you're doing. And may we then have the courage to step into that. Because, God, you have a different destination, a better destination. And it's a destination of impact. It's a destination of freedom. And it's a destination of significance that you have created each one of us for. And so may we experience that over the next few weeks. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.